Okay, so let's start this wonderful presentation. My name is Frank Quivetto, and I'm the executive director of the South Fork Natural History Museum. And I want to welcome you all to a very special presentation titled What's Up in the Spring Sky, presented by the Hamptons Observatory. And I just want to mention that this is just a great collaboration and partnership that we've had with the Hamptons Observatory for many years now. And this is just one added program that we are very excited to be partnering with the Hamptons Observatory. Uh, tonight's program leader is William Francis Taylor. He's the Hamptons Observatory Senior Educator and NASA Solar System Ambassador. He's been, that, he's been with that title since 2014. He is your program presenter tonight. So I'll let uh, William, you can take it on from here. And thanks for everyone for being here. Thanks, William, for doing this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, thank you to everyone at the South Fork Natural History Museum who helped set up this event. Um, let me know if you, anyone has any problems hearing or seeing me, but I'm really grateful to be here with you all. I'm gonna start sharing my um, program that I have. So, um, so uh, I'm just, before, before we move forward, William, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that if there are any questions throughout the presentation for everyone to just type it into the chat, icon and uh, and then William will answer them at the end of the program. Also, if anybody wants to ask him questions at the end of his presentation, they can do so as well. So, uh, all right, sorry for the interruption. Thank you, everyone. Oh, no problem. Thank you again. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out tonight for this presentation. Um, I just wanna say a few things about the observatory, Hamptons Observatory, as many of you know, is a nonprofit based in the East End. We do educational programs um, like this one to tell you what's going on in the night sky, but also to invite scientists, astronomers, people from all walks of life to give presentations about the ways that the night sky or science more generally intersects with human life. Um, and um, for instance, I just wanna let you know that on May 18th uh, at 7 p.m., we have a speaker named Margaret Weidekamp, who is a, a curator, I believe, at the uh, Smithsonian Museum, who's gonna be talking about space artifacts. So uh, over the course of 50 years, there's been a lot of um, space history made. And so this Smithsonian is dedicated to keeping that together. So we're excited to have her come in May. Uh, this evening, I'm going to be speaking about the spring sky. So I'm gonna to try to keep this um, pretty topical to things going on right now. Um, and, um, um, Frank, if you have a moment, if you just let me know if everything looks good, if you can see my screen, so I'm not talking to the air. Um, yeah, look, looks perfect, yep. Okay, great. great, yep. Okay, so um, it seems like in the past couple of days at least, uh, spring has really uh, come to life. I, I had a chance the other day to go to the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, which is a beautiful space, and, and see all these beautiful magnolia trees that have just bloomed. Um, one thing that caught my eye there was a little bit of astronomical gear uh, I was excited to see. Um, so um, the picture I'm sharing right now is of a uh, sundial and also an armillary sphere. Um, so this little gizmo has two jobs in one. Uh, one, it's a sundial. And so uh, it's a very accurate sundial. It's aligned with the north um, and it lets you know the time of day. So I, I took this picture right about um, 1.50. Uh, sundials aren't completely accurate anymore because we artificially add an hour in the summer. And for now on, we're going to be doing that year round apparently. But uh, with uh, uh, sundials in are uh, really a wonderful way to just keep a connection with the sun, which uh, which is not only the reason for the seasons, but also the reasons, um, also a clock for us the time of day. But in, a, in addition to being a, uh, a clock, the sundial is also what's called an armillary sphere, which is something that was invented in the Middle Ages as a representation of the cosmos. So people in the, uh, going back to ancient times, um, saw the universe as sort of a closed sphere surrounding the earth, because um, that's the way it looks to the human eye when you look out there. Um, and uh, the different lines on this armillary sphere represent that sphere, but also represent different paths that the sun takes throughout the year. Um, and so the big band on the outside represents the course of the sun, known as the zodiac. Um, so this, uh, I've taken a picture of the constellation Aries, Pisces, and Taurus. Uh, so these are associated um, in astrology with the time 
uh, of year that we're in now. I think that the astrological season of Aries perhaps is the one we're in right now. I'm not 100% sure. But that's because that's uh, approximately where the sun is during the springtime. Um, as it was moved through the year, the sun travels around the, the starry sphere, the celestial sphere, 360 degrees. Um, but the constellations that it occupies during the springtime are obviously the hardest to see because the sun is right there. So this is a terrible time of year to go out and see Aries. But on the opposite side of this armillary sphere, you see the other side of the zodiac. Um, here I have Virgo, Libra, um, and Leo, I think, on, on the other side. So um, these are the best constellations to see because this is where the sun is the farthest away from. And this annual motion of the sun around the sphere is the reason that we have different constellations for the spring and for the different seasons. Um, now, uh, there's other things happening this seasons that are kind of special, apart from just the usual changes of the constellations. So I made a calendar. On April 11th, we're going to have the best chance this year to see the planet Mercury when it reaches greatest Eastern elongation. I'll explain what that means in a moment. On April 14th, Mars is going to uh, meet up with a moderately bright star called Epsilon Geminorum. Um, it'll become very close. So it'll be fun to see through binoculars. On uh, April 30th, if I've got this date right, I, I might have it wrong. I think it's April 20th, I'm sorry. Uh, there's going to be a solar eclipse, but in Australia, so it's not particularly relevant what date I put on it for most of us on the eastern end of Long Island. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, in April 22nd to the 23rd, uh, we're going to have a meteor shower uh, that I really highly recommend people go to see. That's the Lyrid meteor shower. Uh, it's very favorable this year because the moon will not interfere like it usually does with the meteor showers which is to say that it'll be very dark out. Um, and I recommend um, getting up early on the 23rd. Um, so for instance, two in the morning, three in the morning, that's the best time to look for meteor showers. I remember a few uh, years ago, seeing a really beautiful display of the Lyrid meteor shower in Montauk, where it's very dark out. Um, so I highly recommend doing the same thing. Um, May 15th, uh, Mars will align with Castor and Pollux, two stars in Gemini. And I'll talk about that later. And then on May 17th, we have an occultation of Jupiter, uh, which I'll explain again. But um, overall, uh, it's going to be um, uh, lots, of, lots of usual things and a couple of slightly unusual things happening in the spring. So uh, let me start off by talking about the planet Mercury, because I said that um, April 11th is a good time to look for this planet. Of uh, the five planets that are visible to the naked eye, usually, uh, Mercury is by far the hardest to see because it's so close to the sun. Um, so the best time to go see Mercury is when it is farthest away from the sun from our point of view. Um, that's what it's known as greatest eastern elongation. This is an example of greatest western elongation if it's in the morning. Here's an example of what Mercury and the planet Venus will look like on April 11th. Um, so Venus is uh, the easiest planet to find by far. It's extremely bright, the brightest thing in the night sky. If you look in the sunset direction, um, on April 11th, Venus will be very close to the cluster of the Pleiades um, because it won't be that long after sunset. It might be easier to see the Pleiades with a pair of binoculars, but Venus will be right next to them. Um, and if you look to the lower, if you look to the right, about halfway below Venus, you'll see the planet Mercury. Um, the way to uh, notice that it's Mercury, not something else, is it'll be just about the only thing that looks like a star in that part of the sky. Um, it'll be brighter than the other stars around it. Um, so um, Mercury itself is, uh, uh, well, let, let me just explain the Eastern elongation thing. It's just um, basically like as we travel around the sun, sometimes we see Mercury at inferior conjunctions, perhaps, or superior conjunction. It's in the same direction as the sun. It's very hard to see. A couple of times we get a better view. Um, so Mercury itself is uh, a bit like the moon superficially. It looks to be a little bit bigger. Um, it's covered in craters. It's interesting world. It's, it's very covered in, well, it's very dense compared to the moon. There's a lot of heavy metals um, and it rotates very slowly. So uh, even though the daytime part of Mercury is extremely hot, the nighttime part of Mercury is one of the coldest places in the solar system. 
because uh, it, it is turned away from the sun for so many months on end. Um, some people have speculated that if astronauts ever travel to Mercury in the future, they might be able to just walk along the border between the day and the night. That's called the Terminator because it turns so slowly you could actually just keep up oh, with it. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, that's oh. fun. I, I think someone may need to mute their microphone. Sorry about that. Um, so um, the other interior planet um, is the planet Venus. So Venus is a lot more superficially similar to the Earth in that it's a uh, lot larger than Mercury, similar in size to uh, Earth, but it's covered and very thick clouds. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, if I could ask everyone to mute their microphones, I'm picking up some interference in the background. Um, so if you haven't been able to, yeah, please mic your, thank you, sounds better. So yeah, um, Venus is very similar to Earth in size. It's very dissimilar in everything else. So um, it is a world with continents, but no oceans. Um, recently, we've learned that Venus has a lot of uh, volcanic activity, we think. Um, it's a little bit controversial still, but there hasn't been uh, very much exploration of, of Venus since the 1980s in terms of landers. The last country to land on Venus was the Soviet Union, which doesn't even exist anymore. Um, and so um, the, the highlighted spots here um, are where you see Venera 9, Venera 10, Venera 13, et cetera. Those are the only landings that have ever happened on Venus. It's extremely hard to land there because of the extreme temperatures, hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit, extreme pressures that can crush almost anything, and um, acidic rain on top of everything else. So it's the most probably the most inhospitable place for human beings and even for our machines to land on in the solar system. Uh, here is one of the pictures, I think from 1975, the first picture ever to come back from Venus. There's a, a few of these. So it's, it's pretty rocky. Um, it is not at all like in the old science fiction depictions of a lush, beautiful tropical planet. So here you can uh, pick a really good example here is C.S. Lewis's Paralandra about the, the oceanic delights of Venus. Um, but the actual Venus is a bit of a disappointment from that point of view. Um, from Earth's vantage point, um, there is not that much to see through a telescope of Venus because of its clouds. Its clouds block almost all of the light that comes through. So we cannot see any of the details on Venus that we can see on Mars or even the moon, for instance. But one thing we can see is we can see the different phases of Venus because it's closer to the sun than us. Um, we see it sometimes as a crescent. Um, it's difficult to see Venus at nighttime because it's so much brighter than the background sky. So I recommend if you want to see Venus through a telescope to look in the daytime. Now, it might seem surprising, but you can actually see Venus with your naked eyes in the daytime if it's a blue sky. Um, and here is a, a guide. The, the best way to find it is when the moon happens coincidentally to be right on top of Venus, right next to it. So I highlighted a date, April 23rd um, in the morning, nine o'clock, when if you get up that time and it's not cloudy, you might be able to see Venus very close to the moon. The moon will be in the east northeast. Um, and the moon itself will be not so easy to find because of um, just the fact that it's a very slender crescent. But if, you, if you're patient and you find it, Venus will be right next to it on the right. And if you have a pair of binoculars, it'll be even easier to see. But one, once you do notice it, you'll notice that you can even see it without any kind of binoculars. You can see it with your naked eye. If you happen to have a telescope, you can zoom in um, and you'll see something that looks like this, maybe a little bit better. And I've seen, Venus during the daytime, it's really exciting because you can see a lot more detail than you can um, at night. Um, and it's usually a very clear view. And so it's very interesting to look, look on a, a sister world of Earth about the same size, but much so, so far away that it looks like a tiny little dot in the sky. Um, so something else, speaking of the moon, another thing that happens this month is the solar eclipse in Australia a few other countries, East Timor and Indonesia. That is April 20th. Um, so uh, this happens every year almost, but eclipses happen in usually remote places. Here, it just barely touches the coast of Australia. So this is not of much relevance to most of our listeners on Eastern Long Island, but um, 
people might be listening from any part of the world. So if you happen to live in Australia or if you happen to live in East Timor or Indonesia, this is a, your chance to go see a beautiful event on April 20th. Um, it's a hybrid solar eclipse, which means um, that in some places it'll be a total solar eclipse and other places it won't be quite total. Um, eclipses happen when the shadow of the moon touches the earth. Uh, if you could happen to see the shadow of the moon in space, it would look like an extremely long and slender cone, a uh, pyramid shape that just barely touches the surface of the earth by a wonderful coincidence. So um, usually that cone passes underneath us or over us as the moon goes around the earth. But um, every time, every couple of, more often than you think, usually once a year, it'll actually touch the earth and cause a total solar eclipse somewhere on our planet. Um, I'll have a bit more to say about that later. But another type of uh, eclipse that's happening in um, May is an occultation of Jupiter. And this is something we'll all be able to see in Eastern Long Island. Here's a picture of the occultation of Jupiter that happened in 2005 in Australia. So um, basically Jupiter will disappear behind the moon. Um, it's really fun to notice how much bigger the moon appears to be than Jupiter in this photograph. Even though we all know that Jupiter is 10 times larger than the earth, it's just very much farther away. Now, this occultation is gonna happen in the morning. So it'll happen, um, well, in, our, in East Hampton, on Long Island, uh, it'll happen around 7.41 in the morning. Um, and even though it is at daytime, you can still see the, the bright planets Jupiter and Venus and the moon, of course, during the daytime, if you happen to know exactly where to look. Uh, Jupiter is a little harder to see, but with a pair of binoculars or with a telescope, you can, you can see, the, uh, you can watch as Jupiter disappears. Here is a view without the daytime interfering. Um, I'm not sure how great the details will be when you look through a telescope because I haven't personally seen an occultation during the daytime. But what you should be able to see is over the course of a minute or so, Jupiter will disappear behind the moon. And what I enjoy about this is it gives you a sense of how fast things are happening in space. The moon moves about a kilometer a second through space. Um, and so um, even though the moon is quite far away, at, at certain times you can actually see its motion against the background stars and planets. Um, at 8.51, Jupiter will reemerge. So if you happen to have a telescope or just maybe you have good eyes, you can see this happen and it will just seem like Jupiter has reappeared gradually, but within a minute or so from the blue sky. Um, so. Something to enjoy, um, and um, I haven't seen this during the daytime myself, but um, from what I understand, it's something that you can definitely see, well, at least with binoculars. Now, the times I calculated are for East Hampton, uh, New York. Um, people who live in different parts of North America might have different times, depending on um, where they live. So I recommend if you really uh, live somewhere else and you want to time it right accurately, you can download an app such as Sky Safari, which is what I use to make this illustration. And you can plug in your coordinates and give you more accurate times for your location. The moon is close enough to earth that people in different cities even can see slightly different views of it. So it's good to be careful. Um, now as for Mars, um, the fourth planet, here it is gonna be on April 14th, passing very close to the star called Epsilon Geminorum. Um, and then a few uh, weeks later, um, well, let's see, on May, yep, here it comes. <laughs> May 16th, it'll line up with the stars Castor and Pollux, which are the two bright stars in Gemini. Uh, so Gemini is a very cute constellation. It looks like two stick figures holding hands. It represents the twins, Castor and Pollux of Greek mythology. And so um, it's more of a winter constellation, but we can still see it. Mars is pretty far from Earth right now, getting farther away, but um, still, still pretty visible. Um, it'll be visible for a few more months at least. Now, um, uh, I wanna talk about one of the main um, spring constellations, uh, which in this case is Virgo. So Virgo is one of the 12 zodiac constellations, which means the sun passes through it over the course of the year. So that's the blue line in this illustration called the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the path of the sun. Um, and because the solar system is very flat, 
all of the planets and the moon as well all seem to follow the ecliptic as well as they travel around the sky. Um, uh, so at different times of year, you'll see the moon there. And um, in fact, I think the moon is in Virgo tonight. If you go out and look, it'll help you find Virgo. Now, um, in this illustration, um, which has kind of a stick figure format again, you can see the head of Virgo here on the right, her legs and her arms. And she has one very bright star called Spica, which represents a grain of wheat apparently in a lot of illustrations. So Virgo mythologically um, has been given a couple different names. In some sources, she's called Astraya. In other sources, she's called the goddess of justice. And the stories that I read say that um, she lived on earth um, many countless millennia ago in the golden age of Greek mythology. So uh, when the earth was formed, people lived in harmony. There was no uh, crime, there was no injustice. Um, and the goddess Virgo lived among us, but uh, the golden age turned to the silver age, people became worse. And then the silver age turned to the bronze age and things got really bad. And so Virgo decided to leave earth and take up her residence in the heaven. She couldn't stand it anymore, but <laughs> um, she um, is still up there. Um, sometimes she's associated with the goddess Ceres, who represents agriculture. And that may be why she's holding the grain of wheat in her hand. Um, but um, Virgo is not that hard to find um, if you know where to look. And so here's a little guide. Tonight, the next couple of nights, it'll be very easy to find Virgo because the moon will be right there. That's the white spot right here. But on a normal night with the moon not there, you can use um, a little trick. So start with the Big Dipper, which many people are familiar with. It's actually part of a larger constellation called the Great Bear. So this is the snout of the bear perhaps. Um, it looks like a big polar bear rearing up on its paws. Um, if we follow the handle of the Big Dipper though, um, and follow the curve around, we get to a very bright star here called Arcturus, which is part of the constellation Boötes, which represents a herdsman. Um, and um, the little um, acronym or whatever phrase I've heard is uh, to follow the arc to Arcturus and to speed on to Spica. Spica is a star here, which is highlighted as Alpha Virginis. Um, and so that's the brightest star in Virgo. Um, so for astronomers, one reason Virgo is beloved is because in the springtime, um, in the vicinity of Virgo, we have an unparalleled view of countless, countless uh, galaxies. So we live in a galaxy, we live in the Milky Way galaxy. The galaxy is a cluster of billions upon billions of stars. Our own Milky Way galaxy is tens of thousands of light years across. Um, there are almost somewhere between 100 billion and a trillion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. But the Milky Way galaxy is just one of countless billions of other galaxies in the universe. Um, and so in the springtime, you get to see a lot of them. So in this drawing, you, you can see the constellation Leo, the lion on the right, and Virgo with her outstretched arm here on the left. And in between the tail of Leo and the arm of Virgo, there are it's a cluster of galaxies and the little oval, oval shapes in the drawing. So here is a photograph, long-term, long exposure photograph that um, shows some of the galaxies in Virgo. Um, I love this part of the sky. There's a, there's a trio or maybe four <laughs> galaxies here. It looks like a human face to me or some kind of face. Um, and uh, these galaxies are, all of them much bigger than the Milky Way. They're elliptical galaxies. So our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, uh, which is to say it looks a bit like a whirlpool from, from a distance if we could somehow get outside of it. But uh, when galaxies become very, very large, um, they take on this elliptical shape, sort of like an oval. Um, and the galaxy down here on the lower left is one of the largest galaxies in the universe. It's called M87. So, um, Let's just do a little bit of space geography. We are in the center of this drawing here of galaxies. Um, we're in a cluster of galaxies called the local group. Not a very exciting name. And the local group is basically just three galaxies. It's the Milky Way, it's our neighbor Andromeda, and another neighbor galaxy called Triangulum, which you can see in the fall. Um, but it's a very small cluster compared to the Virgo cluster here on the right, which is enormous. It has I don't know, thousands upon thousands of galaxies, presumably. 
Um, it's one of the largest clusters of galaxies in the universe, um, and the observable universe anyway. Um, and we are actually in some sense a part of a larger structure called the Virgo supercluster because the Milky Way is close enough to the Virgo cluster to be gravitationally attracted to it. Um, it's about 50 million light years away to some of the galaxies in this photograph, for instance, M87 here on the lower left, which I will zoom in on now. So Messier 87 is something that you can see in the night sky with just a pair of binoculars. And it's better to see it through a telescope. This photograph is from the Hubble Space Telescope and shows you something you couldn't possibly see <laughs> without an extremely large telescope on Earth. A few people have seen it. It's called the relativistic jet streaming out of M87. So to put it in some context, our galaxy has, like I said, somewhere over 100 billion stars. The um, galaxy Messier 87 is about 200 times more massive. So um, not only does it have a lot more stars than our galaxy does, it also has an extremely enormous black hole at the center. And for reasons that are not particularly well understood, at the center, uh, at the, in the vicinity of a black hole, there are usually jets streaming out um, at extremely high velocity. So we usually think of black holes as sucking everything around them, but because things are accelerated to such high speeds and create such huge energy in the vicinity of a black hole, sometimes things are ejected away. Um, and these uh, gas clouds being shot out of the black hole um, of Messier 87 are traveling close to the speed of light. Um, now, here is an actual photograph of Messier 87 star, which is the black hole at the center of Messier 87. Uh, this was the first black hole ever photographed, and it requires a little bit of explanation because um, the black holes by definition are invisible, um, but we see them by the effects they have on the gas and stars around them. So um, here, what you see as like the kind of donut of glowing gas is the, um, it's the ring of, uh, of nebulae and stuff falling into Messier 87. Now, this is a more recent photograph. This was from 2017, where recently they've taken a photograph in polarized light, um, which gives you a sense of the magnetic fields around this black hole. They're extremely strong. Um, now, um, this black hole is at the center of Messier 87. Every galaxy that we know about seems to have a black hole at its center, and so does our own galaxy. Um, uh, now, I have a picture that was just taken the last year of our own Milky Way's black hole called Sagittarius A star, uh, which weighs somewhere in the vicinity of a million times the mass of the sun. Um, so even though this black hole is in theory much closer than Messier 87, Messier 87 is 50 million light years away. The, our own galaxy's core is only 27,000 light years away. Um, so this black hole is thousands of times closer, but it's also thousands of times smaller than Messier 87. So the view is not as, uh, in both, both galaxies, both things are very hard to see. Um, both these photographs are incredibly detailed and they're the result of an amazing technology called the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a network of radio telescopes around the entire earth that take advantage of the size of the earth to take as detailed a picture as possible. They give uh, some context for both of these photographs, the black hole um, in both pictures um, is about the size of a golf ball on the surface of the moon. So if you had a telescope that could see one of the golf balls left behind on the moon by the astronauts, um, that's about the level of technology and detail that we're seeing here. So they use a lot of advances in computing technology, radio technology, and just the, the massive distances between telescopes on different continents of Earth to take these photographs. So you and I personally can't see a black hole, we can only say where they are. So let's talk about some things that we can actually see in the night sky. So here is um, uh, a constellation called Corvus that I want to focus on below Virgo. It's close to a, a dimmer drawn out constellation called Hydra, which represents one of the monsters that Hercules fought against. In the Greek myths about Corvus, um, uh, one of the ones I heard is that uh, Corvus was a representative of the god Apollo who uh, was ordered to um, seize, grab some water for Apollo. 
um, represented by Crater, which is a bull. Um, but uh, Corvus the crow kind of dilly dallied on the way to do that and pretended to be attacked by a snake. Apollo saw through this and as a result, placed, uh, placed the bowl of water just out of reach of Corvus so that Corvus could never drink from it. Um, and so for this reason, crows are always thirsty and they have this raspy tone in their throat, just like probably I do at the moment. But um, there, um, <laughs> there are lots of interesting myths and legends about crows from around the world. Not only did the Greeks see this as a crow, so did the ancient Chinese astronomers. And um, I love this constellation because it really does look like a crow to me. Um, these stars here labeled Eta and Delta represent the beak of Corvus. Um, Alpha represents the tail of Corvus. Beta represents um, possibly the feet of the crow. So the crow is sitting here staring at Spica, the grain of corn in Virgo and seems to want it. Um, but I'm gonna talk about Corvus because it's a very cute constellation. It's very easy to see in the night sky, low in the southern sky in the spring. And it also gives us some pointers to some other things in the night sky. So close to the feet um, at beta is what's called Messier 68. That's this circle here with the crossbars through it. Um, that's a globular cluster, which you can see again with just binoculars. A globular cluster is a group of hundreds of, sorry, I should say millions of stars, sometimes thousands of stars, but all, a lot of stars for sure. Um, uh, now, this is a collection of trillions of stars called Messier 104, a galaxy, um, which you can find by following the beak of Corvus in the direction of Virgo. This galaxy is also called the Sombrero Galaxy, and one reason I love it is it looks uh, um, very three-dimensional. And even through a small telescope, you can see this dark dust lane. Now, um, spiral galaxies come in different um, they usually have the basic same shape of a flat disc, like a pancake, but we happen to see them in all kinds of different orientations. So sometimes we see them face on, like Messier 51 and Canis Venatici, one of my favorite spring galaxies. Sometimes we see them edge on, like NGC 4565 in the constellation Coma Berenices. Um, now, Coma Berenices is a... Uh, constellation that you can also see in the springtime, very close to Virgo. Um, Virgo seems to be reaching out for it. Um, and what's distinctive about Coma Berenices is, is not its shape, it doesn't have very many bright stars, but it has a lot of faint stars that make a cluster in space called the Coma Cluster. So this is called an open cluster, as opposed to the globular cluster we saw before, which is millions of stars. This is just a few hundred. Um, and maybe less than 10 or so that you can see with the naked eye. But it is a very beautiful pattern. Um, if you were in a dark spot, like down by the ocean in Montauk or anywhere on the South Shore of Long Island, you can definitely see it. In ancient times, um, this wasn't a constellation until about the second century BC. Um, and um, the story behind this is interesting because most legends in astronomy um, from Greek mythology, you know, are thousands of years old. A lot of them predate the Greeks themselves and come from the Babylonians. Coma Berenices is named after a historic person who was Queen Berenike II of Egypt. She was part of the Ptolemaic Greek dynasty that ruled Egypt for hundreds of years. Um, and the legend is that she made an offering of her hair in order that her husband could be victorious in war. Um, overnight, her hair disappeared from the altar that she placed it in Alexandria. Um, and the court astronomer uh, told her that the hair had actually been taken up in the night and made into a constellation. This might have been a way of soothsaving uh, someone who had stolen the hair, I don't know. But um, in, in, other, in any event, the hair constellation became part of the night sky. So Coma Berenices literally means the hair of Berenike. Um, so it's a very interesting constellation that represents a historic person, one of the very few. So I also uh, said I would talk a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, uh, I talked about this in August, I'm sorry, in October of this year. And since then there have been a couple of new um, photographs taken. So I'm gonna go from closest to earth to farthest away. I'm gonna start with the chameleon molecular cloud, 630 light years away. Um, I love this photograph because you can see the, the structure 
in this cloud, it's a cloud of dust in space. It's quite cold. Um, and um, this dust is some of the most interesting stuff in the universe because it's what we're all made out of originally. Um, every time a star dies or reaches near the end of its life, it, it expels out of dust into space. This dust travels for countless eons until it gravitationally attracts itself again and starts to coagulate into a uh, nebula like we see before us. So um, um, let's see here. So the um, constellation, sorry, the next uh, thing we'll be talking about is NGC 1433, 46 million light years away. Um, so much, much farther. This is a spiral galaxy, like the ones we saw before. But through the James Webb Space Telescope's point of view, it looks very different because it highlights the clouds of dust in particular that we saw in the last photograph up close. Um, but these clouds of dust organize themselves in beautiful spiral patterns um, um, on, a, on a really massive scale. But on the greatest scale of all, let's take a look at Pandora's cluster, 4 billion light years away. So much, much further. So the light that comes from this cluster is um, uh, almost as old as the Earth, even older maybe. Um, here you go. This is a, a cluster of countless thousands of galaxies. So like the Virgo cluster, but even, even on a grander scale. Um, this is a photograph that you can access on the website of the James Webb Space Telescope. I recommend that you do it because you can zoom in and you can just see unbelievable amounts of detail. Um, I can't possibly convey that over the Zoom connection, so I recommend you look at it for yourself. Each one of these little lights, fuzzy little spots that they may be, is an entire galaxy. Um, so a hundred billion to a trillion stars, like our sun, uncountably many planets and worlds. Um, it's just fascinating to think about what might be going on in even a single pixel of this photograph. Um, and also when we look back into space, we're looking back in time because it takes light a certain fixed time to reach us. So this is what the universe looked like 4 billion years ago too. Um, the universe is continuously evolving and changing. Um, and so that's part of what the James Webb Telescope's mission is, um, is to um, figure out how it's changing. Um, so. I wanna talk about one more event that's just one year away. That's in, uh, a year from April 8th, 2024. I, I, I know it's still a year away, but it's not a very long time to plan things. So I wanna talk about the next solar eclipse that will be reaching North America. This is on April 8th, 2024. Um, we will all be very lucky uh, because there is a solar eclipse coming our way. Um, if uh, we have the... <laughs> um, right plans and it will require a lot of planning to see it correctly. Um, it's going to touch down in Mexico, the United States and Canada, but it will only be visible on this yellow strip here that I've that's highlighted, the path to total solar eclipse. If you happen to be, for instance, on Long Island on that day, you won't see a total solar eclipse. You absolutely must travel um, the relatively short distance to upstate New York to see it. Uh, and it's the difference between a 95% total eclipse and an actual total eclipse is is a million fold. It's so much more spectacular to see a total eclipse than to see a partial eclipse. If you've seen a partial eclipse and you thought it was neat, but not very interesting or, or traveling to, you're really missing out. A total eclipse is a life-changing experience. Um, if you happen to be in New York, you can see it. If you're in Buffalo, you can see it in Rochester. You will not see it in New York City. You will not see it on Long Island. So travel is gonna be necessary for this. Um, you can also see it from Vermont. Um, Burlington will be a great place to see it. Um, personally, I plan to travel to Texas for this event, um, uh, because much likelier to see clear skies on that day. If you travel all this way to see a solar eclipse and you are clouded out, it's a very disappointing experience. You don't want that. So you might want to plan to travel even further away because in April, it's usually pretty cloudy in the Northeast, but Texas is more likely to, and the Southwest in general is more likely to have clear skies. Uh, my sister and I traveled to Tennessee in uh, the year 2017 to see our first solar eclipse. It was amazing. Uh, we were very lucky with the weather. Um, 
I can't even describe what it was like to see this eclipse uh, because it's a very emotional experience, but uh, people came from all over the world. Here are some uh, friends we made from Germany. The whole experience as the sky grew dimmer and dimmer was very spooky. It's not like anything has happened to me in my life. Um, it was a, a very surreal experience, the changes in light right before the eclipse. And then the eclipse itself is something unphotographable. You really have to see it with your eyes to appreciate the beauty of the universe that we live in. It's one of these events that just makes you feel incredibly lucky to be living in this universe. Um, and especially on this planet where we have this bizarre and beautiful coincidence that the moon and our sun are exactly the same state, shape and exactly the same size in our sky. Um, and uh, the, I started talking about um, black holes <laughs> before we're talking about Virgo. Uh, with the total solar eclipse, you can actually see what appears to be a black hole right in the sky. And it's an amazing experience. So that is all I have to share with you today. Thank you so much um, for listening to that. And I'd be happy to take any questions you have. I'm sure that some have been logging up. And also if you want to um, uh, just ask a question, feel free. Um, I think everybody can, uh, whoever has a question can just unmute themselves and ask William the question. There was one question from Pete about yeah, but which program I was using to take um, images of Venus or to show what Venus will look like in the coming month. That was a one, that's an app called Sky Safari. Um, there was a question from Penelope uh, explaining the idea of elongation. So um, basically, like, uh, let me go back. Well, um, basically, I'll just say that. Um, Mercury is closer to us than the sun, so is Venus. So both of them never seem to travel very far from the sun in the night sky, as opposed to the other planets, which we can see in any direction because we are kind of between them and the sun. Mercury is uh, very close to the sun, so it always seems to be very close to it. Um, and that makes it very hard to see. Um, every so often, it just happens that uh, the angle between Mercury and the sun is as great as it can be. Mm, this is maybe a weird analogy, but if you imagine a dog on a leash, um, a person walking a dog like on a leash, sometimes you might see the dog and the person in the same direction and they look very close to each other, but sometimes you might see the dog as far from the person as can be. Um, and so um, Mercury is like that. It's, it's a bit like it's on a leash. Uh, it never travels very far from the sun. So um, I recommend um, this one, April 11th, but you can also go out any in the few days before or after and try to see it. Mercury moves pretty quickly. So um, if you wait too long, you won't, you won't, you'll miss it. Let's see here. Um, th thank you all for your uh, compliments and thank you all for being here. Um, if anyone, uh, wants to, you know, ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself. And maybe, I don't know if anyone needs help with that. Uh, Rob says he didn't realize how large outer space really is. I don't think it's possible to realize how large outer space is. It's um, even just to think about the distance from here to the moon, uh, it's kind of humbling. And the moon is by far the closest thing in space. Um, uh, and, and if you um, get the chance to see Venus, for instance, um, through a telescope, I find it really a humbling experience too, because um, Venus is the same size as the Earth, and we all have an approximate idea of how big the Earth is, right? We live on it. So when you see Venus as just this tiny little dot, maybe a little crescent in the night sky, you realize how far away it must be. Um, so, um, Let's see here. Um, one question is about any suggestion for intro telescopes. Um, my suggestion is always to get a pair of binoculars before you get a telescope if you're, if you're in astronomy, because even with a simple pair of uh, binoculars, maybe um, ones with uh, lenses, um, sometimes they, they market them as like 10 by 50, which means that the, the lens is 50 millimeters. That's a good size to get. Um, because even with that, you can see a lot of star clusters, you can see a lot of galaxies, and you can see a lot of uh, detail on Jupiter, for instance, you can see the moons of Jupiter. 
Um, and if you get excited enough through your pair of binoculars, you've seen a lot, you want to see more, I'd recommend getting, um, I, well, I, I can only talk about myself and my preferences, but I have what's called the Dobsonian telescope, which is um, an affordable type of telescope that uh, gives you a lot of mirror size. Mirror, it gives you, uh, it gives you a very large mirror for very little money. Um, and with that, you can see a lot of details in the moon. You can see a lot of details from the planets and you can see a lot of faint galaxies like the ones I mentioned before. Um, if you are interested in astrophotography, we need a different type of telescope and I can't really give you any recommendations on that. I've never, never done too much with that. Um, Pete asked, what's the best direction to look in the night sky? And I think that probably depends on where you live. But if um, I can only speak for people on Eastern Long Island because that's where I'm from. But I recommend looking in the direction of the ocean because that's where there is the least amount of light pollution. So for instance, if you happen to go out to Montauk, um, if you look towards the south in the east, which is where the ocean is, you'll see a lot more. You'll see a lot of beautiful uh, constellations like the ones I highlighted tonight, like Virgo and Corpus. And um, in the summertime, you'll see the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and um, Otherwise, um, it depends on the time of year, but I generally look in the south because that's where um, a lot of uh, things are changing. The north is always the same in the sense that there's a few constellations like Ursa Major, Ursa Minor that are always there. But in the south, that's what changes a lot throughout the seasons. So I recommend that. And um, so thank you, Donna, again. For, uh, for organizing all the events that we do and for, for letting us know about what's coming up at, um, through the Hamptons Observatory website. You can access through the chat. Um, and um, yeah, if nobody else has any questions, I, I wish you all a great night. Make sure to go outside tonight, it's clear, at least here where I am. And so it's a great night to do some stargazing. Thanks, William. Thanks everyone for being here tonight. Have Thank a great you. evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. And if Thank you, you are now. free, uh, May 18th, remember to come back to us and check out uh, Margaret White account and we'll be talking about the history of space artifacts. Thank you.